Before we get into Mendelian genetics, I want to talk a little bit about the early ideas of inheritance. Because long before we knew how traits got from parent to child, we were observing that offspring tended to look like their parents. And of course, we had all these notions of how traits were passed from parent to child before someone actually really started testing um, and quantifying the observations that we were making to come up with laws and theories that have held up over time. So some of the old explanations, one of them was proposed by Lamarck, and it became known as Lamarckism, and that was that you could inquire traits that you'd, or you could, your children could inherit traits that you'd acquired during your lifetime. So it was the inheritance of acquired characteristics. And so that would be something like a blacksmith has, you know, big muscles because he's pounding metal all day. And lo and behold, his sons grow up and they have big arm muscles too. Um, another classic example of this is the giraffe. Um, they really thought that giraffes had long necks because of the sheer determination of early giraffes that saw those plants high in the air and they reached and stretched their necks out so that they could eventually, over time, their children had longer and longer necks from the effort of reaching and stretching their neck so that generations later, giraffes all had very, very long necks. Again, sort of sounds ridiculous to us now, didn't seem as ridiculous then. It actually took quite a while to dispose or dispel some of these notions. Another one was preformationism. That involved the hum homunculus or humunculus. That was an idea that there were tiny humans um, in sperm that would travel to the womb and develop there. But you know, again, that doesn't help to explain how children look like their mothers as well as their fathers, and that one was a pretty easy one to dispel early on. Pangenesis was a little more difficult to dispel, this idea that characteristics from both parents traveled through the blood to reach their offspring. Um, I think dispelling this one involved blood transfusions and rabbits. So if you're interested, you can look into that. Um, it was Francis Galton, Charles Darwin's cousin, that worked on that problem. And then there was the issue of blending. There was this notion that traits blended. There weren't distinct hereditary particles. Um, that was the particulate idea. This was the blending idea. And they could see things like skin color had a huge spectrum of characteristics. Um... And the only way to explain that, they thought, was that traits blended. Something like juice and water, and you pour them together and they blend. But you can't ever dilute the juice enough to make the pink of, say, cranberry juice go away. So that was the notion of blending. And again, that was a misinterpretation of the diversity of traits we see, like hair colors and skin colors that have a wide spectrum or variety of possibilities. This is the guy that really figured things out. He is Gregor Mendel, or Johann, before he became Gregor, and he is the father of modern genetics. Um, Mendelian genetics is named for Gregor Mendel. This fascinating man was 16 years old when cell theory was proposed, so very early on in our understanding of molecular biology, he was already figuring out this puzzle that everyone else was struggling with. He was the only son of a peasant farmer, and his town had a school led by a man that taught st students about gardening and the basics of plant breeding, along with the really traditional school topics. And so that got Gregor Mendel very interested in hybridization and, you know, breeding and, you know, making better plants. You know, his son, his father's a farmer, and so he... he He's interested and he's driven to learn more. And so he goes to boarding school, which, you know, is not a normal thing for a son of a peasant farmer. It's very expensive to go to boarding school. And um, the knowledge necessarily isn't something you're going to use if you take over your father's farm. 
but um, that was really what he wanted to do. And eventually, oh, after lots of family drama, because, you know, is he going to take over the family farm? Is he not? Eventually, his brother-in-law, so his sister's husband, bought the farm from his father. That helped provide him a little money for schooling, and it also freed him from that obligation to come home and take over the farm. Um, his schooling wasn't cheap. He worked hard as a tutor. He had that little bit of money from his brother-in-law, but eventually he did join the church, and that would have provided a lot more funds for more schooling. Um, and he was at that point then studying theology as well as plant breeding and the natural sciences and these other topics he was very interested in, including mathematics. Um, he wasn't really well suited, his personality, to tending after the sick and the old and the dying. Um, so he was encouraged to pursue teaching instead. That was something friars would do. But he failed his exams. He failed them once, was sent back for more school, failed them again. And so he basically lived the rest of his life as far as teaching credentials went um, as a substitute teacher, even though he was beloved by his students, according to many reports, um, not so, not so good at the, the passing of these examinations. They would have been a lot like doctoral examinations where you were discussing things with a panel as well as written exams. Um, some people think that it was because his thinking was so far ahead of the time that he disagreed with a lot of the current ideas about the natural sciences. Um, I don't have any evidence one way or the other, but eventually he used the observations that he was making tending the Abbey's garden to discover that pea plants seemed to have very distinct traits, and he studied those traits, kept meticulous records, and um, with his knowledge of math, discovered some of the laws of heredity that we know today. 